In the summer of 2011, these images were discussed all over the internet. They show the new residence of the Norwegian terrorist Andres Breivik. For terrible crimes that would lead to life imprisonment and harsh conditions in the neighboring Russia, Breivik receives the maximum prison sentence possible in Norway. 21 years. All with a spacious cell with a personal office, a computer, separate bedroom, and a gym. Something which over a billion people on our planet can only dream of. Knowing all of this, a fair question comes to mind. How does the average Norwegian citizen, who earns about 5,000 euros per month, live? Do they dine in restaurants every day and change their cars every year? Not at all. They use public transportation, buy clothes on sale, and groceries at regular shops near where they live. Why such modesty? Well, first of all, almost half of their salary go to taxes. And second of all, even basic things like bread and public transportation in Norway are very expensive. But Norwegians know for sure that they'll have the best healthcare and education. Everything they eat grow in environmentally friendly conditions, and the money they give to the state will secure their future. And right now, they are still improving their country. At the moment, Norway is one of the richest, most developed and happiest countries in the world. But it wasn't always like this. 100 years ago, Norway was much less prosperous than all of its neighbors, and Norwegians were fleeing to the US for a better life. And so, how did Norway end up in the elite club, and why can't its closest neighbors do the same? December 23, 1969. The day that divided Norway's history into before and after. It was when American oil company Philips Petroleum discovered a large oil field called Ekofisk. Pay attention to where this field is, just a few dozen kilometers from the border with the UK. This is because four years earlier, UK, Norway, and Denmark decided to draw lines on the continental shelf to avoid future resource claims. In 1974, one of the world's largest oil and gas fields, Stadfjord, was discovered on the dividing line and a large part of the fuel ended up on the Norwegian side. As if fate itself decided to give the precious gift to a small European country with a population of 4 million. And this time, it seems it didn't make a mistake. History knows examples of how vast oil reserves eventually destroyed countries' economies. Venezuela, Iraq, Libya. People are fleeing from those countries clearly not out of a good life experience. The Soviet Union and currently Russia also became hostages of this oil needle, failing to fully capitalize on the sudden influx of oil dollars. But Norway succeeded, and today it's completely independent of oil that made it rich. What's the secret? This is of course a hall combination of factors. First is governance. Despite the king of Norway, the real management of the country happens by the hand of Storting, formerly bicameral, currently unicameral parliament. Thanks to it, Norway regained its independence in 1905 and elected King Haakon VII. In 1931, Vikkun Quisling became the Minister of Defense of Norway and held the position until 1933. In May of the same year, he created his far-right political party, the National Unity, which would be quite unpopular in Norway itself, but still supported by Nazi Germany. Despite Norway's desire for neutrality during Second World War, 80% of the necessary German military industry, including Swedish iron ore, went through Norwegian port of Narvik. Britain and Germany began making, capturing plans. The Germans outplaced the British, and by the summer of 1940, Norway found itself under German occupation. Quisling led a puppet government in Norway, and his name became synonymous with the word traitor. After the end of the Second World War and liberation of Norway from the Nazis, Quisling was arrested and executed. Before his death, he said that in 10 years he would be revered as Saint Olaf. But that did not happen. In 1946, the Labour Party won the elections, and its leader Einar Gardsen, who would later be called the father of the nation, began implementing socialist reforms in the capitalist country. Norway introduced a progressive tax system, which still works to this day, and thanks to which, the country formed a middle class. What does this mean? Suppose a person earns 150,000 crowns per year, which is about $40,000, has no personal transportation except for a bicycle, and lives with their parents in a small village far away from the major cities. In this case, they will not pay a penny of budget money, and all the money they earn, they can spend on themselves. 
But a large farmer with a car, real estate, and stocks will have to shell out quite a bit, paying income tax, property tax, transportation and tourist tax, parking fee, and corporate tax. Thus, they won't have as much free money, so to say. But at the same time, each Norwegian family receives support for the second child. And in case of a single parent, they have the same for the first child. They have free nine-year education, a credit fund for students, and a pension program for orphan children. And they hadn't even found oil in the North Sea at that time. When members of Storting realized the wealth their country now possessed, they voted to create the state oil company Statoil, now called Equinor and the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate, which could regulate the industry. They also formulated the 10 oil commandments, including national supervision and control on platforms. Norway's independence from oil suppliers from other countries, development of new industries based on oil, and environmental protection. Until the mid-80s, oil prices were rising, but then they started to drop. The Norwegian government understood the need to move away from the oil dependence and had to create financial safety net. On June 22, in 1990, they established the Norwegian Government Pension Fund, initially known as the Norwegian State Oil Fund. Until 1996, funds were used to cover budget lags. However, when the Ministry of Finance made the first deposit, the fund developed a clear strategy for utilization and growth. To prevent inflation from eroding the funds, active investments were made in stocks of such companies as Apple, Microsoft, Coca-Cola, Amazon, and over 9,000 other companies as well as 73 countries, primarily in the US, UK, and Japan, accounting for almost 70% of the assets. The fund avoids investing in Norwegian companies to prevent overheating of the economy. The remaining 30% of assets includes government and corporate bonds and real estate. Only excess income from hydrocarbon sales is invested, while the main fund remains untouched. Today, its size is almost one and a half trillion dollars, having tripled since its inception, and its value changes every second. Although its value is denominated in Norwegian kroner, the fund consists of multiple currencies, including those it acquires to maintain its own stability. Of course, staying in the positive is not always guaranteed. In 2008, during the global financial crisis, the fund lost over $90 billion but quickly recovered and resumed its growth. Big losses were also incurred in 2022 after Russia's attack on Ukraine. They sold all Russian stocks, losing $164 billion. But the fund offset these losses through new investments the following year. Today, this fund owns 1.5% of all the world's stocks, making it the largest investor on the planet. The second factor is the small population and resource-rich territory. There are only 5.5 million people in Norway. Dividing national wealth in Norway is quite different from distributing it among the 28 million population of Venezuela or the 143 million Russia. If the entire pension funds were divided among all Norwegians, each would receive around $265,000. This amount would be sufficient in Norway to buy an apartment or a country house a Tesla, and possibly have some money left for starting a small business. However, this won't happen because the fund was primarily created for the future generations. By the way, in Venezuela, an oil fund was also established with clear rules for use even before Hugo Chavez came to power, and by 2003, it had managed to accumulate $2.5 billion. But the new government quickly spent the money, apparently counting on the high oil prices to last. However, after Hugo Chavez's death, oil prices fell, and Venezuela Venezuela's economy, entirely dependent on oil extraction and sales, rapidly collapsed. The year 2023, with 538% inflation, can be considered quite successful, considering that in 2018, the country with the world's largest reserves of black gold had a million seven hundred thousand percent inflation. Another oil-rich country, Libya, also experienced a massive influx in the 70s, but the leader of the Libyan Jamahiriya in those days, Muammar Gaddafi, spent a significant portion of the earned funds and military equipment from the Soviet Union. By the time oil prices fell, Libya, just like Soviet Union, faced serious financial problems and had to embark on the path of restructuring. However, it's also worth noting that unlike Norway, Venezuela, Libya, Iran, and Iraq try to resist the Western bloc, primarily in the form of the United States. In the best case, this resulted in economic sanctions and in the worst case, direct military conflict, leading to dissolution of Ba'athist Iraq and the Libyan Jamahiriya. 
In addition to oil, Norway has an enormous amount of water resources. On the one hand, this includes fish and seafood, one of Norway's main industries. It is also one of the primary reasons why this European country, a member of NATO and a signatory of the Schengen Agreement, has not joined the European Union. In short, Norway is reluctant to share its signature stockfish, which everyone would fish abundantly if it joined the Union. Furthermore, the EU membership would disrupt established pricing by abolishing fees and introducing cheaper products, potentially displacing local products from store shelves and impacting Norwegian farmers and fishermen. Finally, high prices and absence of EU legislation makes the country less attractive to refugees, who although present in Norway are in much smaller number than in countries like France or Germany. On the other hand, the abundance of rivers provide a relatively environmentally friendly way of generating hydroelectric power. Currently, Norway has 1600 hydroelectric power stations. Recently, it was discovered that Norway has the world's largest deposit of phosphate rock, which would be sufficient for the entire world for more than 50 years. Today, phosphates are used not only as fertilizers, but also for manufacturing computer chips and panels for solar batteries. Currently, the main supplier of phosphates are China, Morocco, Russia, United States, and Brazil. But it seems that Norway will lead this list in the near future. The estimated value of these reserves is approximately $24 trillion. And there's no doubt that Norway will be able to utilize this resource as wisely as it did with oil. And so the third and most important factor is Norwegians themselves, their character and mentality. You've probably heard and seen what Scandinavian minimalism is all about. Simplicity in details and lack of excess. During the oil crisis of 1973, caused by OPEC countries refusing to sell oil to the West, Norwegians, despite the discovered oil fields, had to tighten their belts and limit personal car trips, just like the rest of Western Europe. King Olaf V, freed from these restrictions, once took skis and traveled without security in a suburban train. The rest of the time he stood in traffic like everyone else, although the law allowed him to use public transport lane. Currently, 80% of cars sold in Norway have electric engines. Norway is the third country in the world in the number of electric vehicles after China and the US. And in percentage terms, it is far ahead of the entire planet. This is true patriotism, which is the main key to the success of the Kingdom of Norway.